So good afternoon, good morning uh, to everybody. It's a great privilege for me to be part of this discussion of democracy and why it matters. Probably it matters most when we have the feeling and the fear that we can lose it. So what I'll try to do basically is not just trying to repeat many of the conversations that we had about what went wrong and what basically we should fear, but try to frame differently some of the problems that we are facing. And I'll start with the fact that what has changed about our conversation on democracy is very much the perspective that we have 30 years ago. At the end of the Cold War, then Vice President of the United States was Dan Quayle, and he was very much ridiculed for saying and promising his audience that the future will be better tomorrow. He was wrong. The future was better yesterday, because in 1990 and 1990s, we had the feeling that we know how the future is going to look like. And when it comes to democracy, we knew that democracy is going to spread. And of course, there are going to be setbacks. And of course, there are going to be a lot of faking of democracies. But at the end of the day, liberal democracy was the other name for political modernity. Now, some of our expectations basically looks much more problematic. And if you see at the global report, for example, of the, uh, uh, of, uh, the Swedish uh, VDEM Institute, you're going to see that they claim that uh, the average global citizen today enjoys as much democracy as uh, he or she did in 1990. And also the Future of Democracy Institute in the Cambridge University came with a kind of distressing news that the young people, the younger generation are the most dissatisfied with the poor performance of democracies and the millenniums in the world today are much more dissatisfied with democracy than the previous generation at their stage. So I'm saying all this because this sense of crisis is very strong and uh, well, if you all remember, particularly after the tragic events in the United States on January 6, there was a lot of talk about do we enter a certain type of a Weimar moment? Uh, what is happening with democracies, particularly in the Western world? And I'm going to use this uh, uh, Weimar metaphor because Peter Gay, the famous European historian, uh, when he was trying to diagnose the tragic death of the Weimar democracy, he basically they defined it as, as part murder, part wasting sickness, and part suicide. So now when I fully we're trying to see what to do in order to have democracy back on the agenda, and it was very clear that it was the major message coming of the visit of President Biden to Europe, I will try basically to distinguish these three parts. The murder part, the wasting sickness part, and the suicide part. Let's start with the murder. One of the things that we know very well today is that democracy has friends, democracy has enemies. And uh, from this point of view, the rise of China and Russia economically, China obviously is much more powerful than the Soviet Union ever was in the days of the Cold War. And the China's economic model looks probably attractive, not necessarily for the Western societies, but for many uh, countries and societies in the developing world. So this kind of a rise of China, in my view, makes it very difficult to believe that simply because our societies are democracies, we're going to open them. The experience of COVID-19, at least for me, was a very strong signal that the nature of the political regime is not enough to guarantee you how well you're we going to respond to certain disasters. Some democracy did very well in responding to COVID-19. Some democracy didn't. And this is the same for the authoritarian rules. So this automatic understanding that simply because we are democracies, we are going to prevail, I don't believe it is valid anymore. And particularly in a world in which some of the technological changes that we're experiencing is helping uh, authoritarian regimes. The level of social control that can be achieved in the artificial intelligence age is something that all dictators can only dream <laughs> for. So say all this for me, the most important difference when you talk about the external threat that democracy is facing is that if in the age of the Cold War, 
Soviet Union, but this was true also for Mao's China, the major dream was to transform all societies in the world, basically exporting their own political model. And it was as a result a bit much easier to basically argue with them because you all the time are comparing their own political system with ours. My first argument is that what has changed is that now blurring the border between democracy and authoritarianism is becoming the primary goal, the primary goal of all these authoritarian regimes. Uh, uh, during the World War II, there was a famous uh, Nazi uh, operation, which was uh, called Bernhardt. And the Bernhardt operation was forging British banknotes, and the idea was to drop them in England in order to collapse uh, British economy. This operation didn't uh, do particularly well, but I do believe that what we're seeing in the information space, particularly in the Western democracies, is exactly this. Trust is the major political currency for any democratic society. And unfortunately, basically, all these kind of uh, uh, forms of uh, uh, misinterpretation, force, uh, fake news, all this is making very difficult for democratic, democratic societies to function in the way that people expect it to function. So the erosion of trust, I find the most dangerous and problematic long-term development. And this is really difficult because we till the moment does not have a great experience how to reverse this trend how you can basically resist this combination of fragmentation and polarization that you have in many democracies. And today, when we're talking to Dimaid, we're very much encouraged of what we're seeing during these days uh, in Brussels and before it in England, during the G7 and uh, the NATO and the US uh, EU meetings. It is critically important to understand that, at least in my view, this political polarization makes it very difficult for the transatlantic democratic community to function as ever before. If Europeans are going to fear every change of government in the United States is a possible regime change, if Americans are going to fear the same about countries like France or Bulgaria, uh, I do believe it's going to be very difficult. And from this point of view, references to the Cold War are not going to help as much. Uh, when we talk about this type of uh, wasting sickness, uh, I'm not going to refer to major social inequality and major other social problems that have been discussed uh, 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 for the last years. I just want to put one issue that in my view is slightly neglected or probably we don't know how to talk about. And this is that why we're talking about a lot about democratic change. I do believe we are slightly blind to the major challenge coming from demographic transition. Demographic transition is really going to change our societies dramatically. Uh, the most radical, by the way, example is not some of these European states that I'm normally much more knowledgeable about, but look at the demography of such a successful Asian democracy like South Korea. If we believe demographic projections, in the next 40 years, South Korea is going to lose half of its population. More than 40% of the people are going to be on the retirement age in order basically to keep its welfare state. It is going to need in year 2045, 30% of the people on the working age most probably are going to be foreigners compared to the 3% now. This is a dramatic change. And this is a dramatic change because democratic societies in a certain way and democratization was taking place in a society that had been quite stable demographically. And we can see how democ demographic change can be weaponized. We can see how it can create panics and paranoia in different societies. And when I'm seeing what is happening in many of our democracies, I'm reminded by the famous poem of Bertolt Brecht from the 1950s, when he said, listen, if the government does not like uh, the people, they should dissolve the people and elect a new one. Paradoxically, to a great extent, what many of Western democracies are going to face in the next 25, 30 years is that governments are going to elect their people. And it is exactly what kind of people the governments are going to elect that are going to be a major difference between liberal and illiberal regimes. Because by designing the citizenship rules, by designing the electoral rules, we're going to end up with one or another type of uh, a democratic 
or authoritarian regime. And I'm saying this because the demographic transition is also dramatically affecting the intergenerational conflict. You can see it very clearly in many European societies. Uh, the younger generation is best educated that we ever had. At the same time, many of these young people had the feeling that they do not have the political power to make the change that they need because they don't have the numbers. And if we're not going to find the way, basically, uh, to empower these young people, I do believe we're going to have a real problem. And I'm going to end up on the suicidal story. Uh, part of the threat that we face is to get to our midst. Many of the transformations and challenges that democracies face are simply challenges any modern societies face. And neither Russia, no China, nor any of those authoritarian societies are better positioned to deal with this. So in my view, one of the most important thing is not to trivialize the changes that we see. Not all of the problems of the democracies today are just the result of the external threats. Many of the problems are structural problems that we have within our own societies. But still, even today, 30 years after the 1990s, I do believe democracies are much better positioned to deal with the problems of modern society than the authoritarian regimes do.